Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to talk here. I'm uh, very excited to uh, walk you through two of the topics um, of today that I will be presenting on. And I switched them around because I think that uh, we will have um, more questions and uh, back and forth maybe on the second part. So really the use of Bookdown uh, for HDA. Uh, but before that, I also have um, a small introduction to a, a package that I used recently, CBS OData R. So this is the package from the National Statistics Bureau in uh, calculating productivity losses in R. Um, I will try to keep both presentations rather short and um, I would be very happy uh, to have a discussion also. So please always interrupt me um, if you have questions and I will show uh, some, uh, some, some R uh, input and also output. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so very briefly about me. I'm uh, Frederick Thielen, Assistant Professor at the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management. Uh, I'm using R since I think 2015 uh, for my uh, daily work and also uh, privately, uh, for example, my uh, website. Um, uh, I see also that uh, some some of these presentations, for, for example, that I give is also completely done in R. And um, I just got uh, yesterday evening uh, inspired by Alison Hill, uh, who is um, providing very many R code and also in doing these presentations. So um, I, there st I see that there's still a typo here in my Twitter account. I will correct this later. But uh, for the rest, uh, many of these slides are inspired by her. Um, I'm a nurse by background. I studied uh, European public health in Maastricht uh, University and uh, health science research. Uh, so I have no background in computer science. I have no real background in programming. I have no clue about CSS, LaTeX, HTML, JavaScript, etc. So really basic knowledge. And um, I hope that most of you also, uh, well, those who do not have that uh, too, um, I will hopefully be able to take away the fear of using Bookdown and using uh, R at a more uh, intermediate uh, level for the analysis that you are doing. All the material that I show here, including the slides, um, are also available on my GitHub account. Here's the link for that. Um, and um, uh, yes, so you can, you can uh, yeah, feel free to use this uh, for your own purposes. First, I will start with estimating Dutch costs for productivity losses and are using up-to-date data from Statistics Netherlands. Um, and I know that maybe also with the chat, it's a bit difficult to ask questions, but um, uh, I would still try maybe the first one. I don't know if you, uh, if you did this in the previous sessions also with the uh, reactions raising hand. The first question um, would be, who of you is uh, usually downloading data sets from the internet and then uh, putting them into a folder um, and then loading this into, into an R session uh, to do some calculations. Um, is there a possibility to see hands here? All right. I see some hands popping, it, uh, popping up. This is also what I usually do. I go to website, for example, Statistics Netherlands, I download the data set and then load it in. Um, and, and the second one, uh, the second question relates more to the second part later, but uh, who is not usually using our markdown for writing reports and um, doing the analyses in HTA or what, whatsoever. Okay, that's good. Uh, at least some, so I hope that you will uh, benefit from this uh, presentation uh, mostly. So productivity losses, very short. I will keep the uh, idea about productivity losses when and how to incorporate them very, uh, very, very brief. So usually we um, look at productivity losses when people uh, become sick and they cannot uh, go to work anymore. Um, then um, they, uh, we want to uh, account for this um, uh, in um, economic evaluations. And uh, most uh, economic evaluation guidelines also require this uh, to be included, uh, for example, example, uh, in the Netherlands. There's some more literature, uh, Kohl and Brauer in 2014, they uh, go a little bit more into detail. So click the link if you are interested. And um, the Dutch guideline, um, or later briefly Dutch EE guideline recommends the friction cost method. There are several methods. I won't go into detail for these methods, but the friction cost method is the one that's recommended here. And uh, one example uh, for the friction uh, cost uh, method, so this is the formula for it, is um, that you have um, a specific formula. This is fixed. Um, the friction cost is uh, calculated by the days of a year divided by um, the vacancies filled in one year um, by, divided by the vacancies open plus uh, 28 days. So this method is fixed. fixed. It relies on CBS data. 
and um, can be calculated uh, anew every time. Um, the uh, problem with this is if you have, um, if you look into the guideline, then there is one um, uh, value written there. So this 12.1 uh, weeks uh, or 85 days for the friction period. And this was in 2014. What we see very often, and I had recently also talk, um, uh, a similar talk with my colleagues and um, did a poll there. Many uh, colleagues still use these 12.1 weeks and they are not updated. Although of course the dynamics on the working on the labor market change constantly. And so we would also uh, need to um, update this. And this is only the first step in de determining the productivity losses. There are many more components that we need. So not only the time that people uh, that we should account for, um, that people are not uh, be able to work anymore, but we also need to have productivity prices, maybe a male-female uh, ratio um, and a percentage working at a specific age group, depending on the disease that we are looking at, and uh, productivity losses for unpaid work may also be relevant. But now um, let's focus um, on the um, on, on the amount on the amount of the friction period, and um, the friction period and all other elements need to be recalculated for the analysis that we are um, that we are interested in. So for the year, for the respective year, the classic approach to do this would be to go to the CBS data, look at the uh, latest table and the latest fig figures, and then perform some calculations. Maybe indeed downloading an Excel file or a CSV file into, um, into the downloads folder and then putting this back into the R session and do some calculations there. The downside of this is of course that this is very time consuming. It's probably much copy and paste from downloaded data. I self made the experience that if you open a CSV data just to have a, a glimpse at it um, in Excel, sometimes uh, weird things happen and then the CSV data is not, it cannot be read anymore um, uh, as it's supposed to be. And um, sometimes projects uh, may take longer or need an update, and then you uh, need to go back to the website and do exactly the entire procedure again. But luckily, there is an R approach to that, and this is um, uh, because we have, uh, uh, thanks to a package that is written, um, and this is written by people that work at the CBS, and uh, this is uh, what we can use to automate this process. So another possibility with this in R would be to write a function and to standardize the approach to automatically, so to say, download CBS data from the servers and only to keep what you need and then build in some flexibility. That means if you have an update uh, to run or another project, you just take the same code and run the analysis again. And this could be done with either using existing packages of so CBS or data R, write your own function and then use it and reuse it and reuse it again. There are uh, several packages from national statistics bureaus, not only for the Netherlands, I found also some for Canada and Germany, but the list can be, uh, yeah, goes on and on. There's some search, uh, of course, uh, to be done here for your respective country, if you want that. And also you have to bear in mind that if you use these packages, it does not mean that all the R code I show here is also uh, working with the other packages because every package has, of course, their own um, way of writing and downloading things and uh, programming. Standards are not uh, very unique here, so to say. So um, if we dive deeper in the CBS or data R package, then there are several steps I at least identified in uh, using this for the friction period. First, we need to identify the needed data source. I will show you later how this is done. Second, we need to download the data still, of course, but this is now an automated process, hopefully, and it's done in R and there's no uh, clicking and uh, copy pasting involved anymore. And um, the, uh, I will build in some flexibility for the code only to run um, when this is needed. So we only need for one specific year, download the data set for one project only once and not every time because this will take some uh, time and resources, of course. And also we will build in some flexibility for later updates and the reuse of code in different uh, projects. Then in the third step, we do our calculations. Of course, we need to calculate the friction period and then we put everything in a function to be able to use and reuse this in several projects. So first step is of course, ident identifying the good data source and all data can be found on and searched on the CBS website or via Google. Of course, and each data source has a spe specific identifier. 
So if you, for example, would click on this link, then you will see uh, the table um, with the needed information for the friction period. And this link or this URL has a, um, a identifier at the end, and this is um, 80472NNED. So this is a unique identifier for this, um, uh, for this data set. If you click on this, then you will see it on line and you will have also the possibility to download this as a CSV um, uh, data. Um, but then you have this your download folder and then you have the old approach. But there's also a possibility uh, to um, search and browse the catalog that's available um, uh, that's available through R. And I see that there are sometimes um, um, questions in the chat popping in. Um, <clears throat> Is this something I should address right now, or is this moderated? Yeah, I suggest um, we address this at the end when we get the Q and A. At the moment, it's just a request to share your links at the end. All right. So, will you uh, will you tell me if there's something urgent? Uh, all right. Then I can close the chat because otherwise, I always have to click and click and. Uh, okay. Thank you. So we can also browse this uh, through uh, R, and uh, most of this is, of course, in the package on the package side um, in, on GitHub. But the idea here of this presentation is really to get you going and to start using these things, even if you don't um, uh, read lots of the um, underlying um, uh, documentation. Um, this is at least how I usually approach this. I do a lot of trial and error um, and get very frustrated, but the reward when it works out is also very high. If you like the, another approach and read uh, everything of our packages first and then only start, then this is of course also a very valid and a very good uh, way to go. But anyways, this is, this is code that runs um, um, in your uh, R session. So first of course, you have to install the package CBSO data R and you re read it in. And then there's a CBS search um, function where you can put a, a, a query. And now this is Dutch data. So some of this will also be um, uh, in Dutch. So vacature is really the word for, uh, for, for, um, uh, for open um, uh, op the vacancies basically in the job market. We store this in an object, and then we can look at the object. The object is quite big, um, basically, but we are only at, um, interested in the identifier here and the title. So this is um, why I subset this data frame um, into only the columns that I want uh, to see. That is the identifier and the title. And um, I wrote for this presentation a, um, a short function that returns this um, uh, data frame into a nice looking um, data table for this presentation. So what we see here um, when we download and uh, we look at the um, object results, then we see the different identifiers. These are the numbers of the data tables that we want or the data sets, and we have a short title. Now from the title, I already know which one to use, um, but if you need more information, then there's also other columns that tell you a little bit more about what is in this data set and also when this was last updated and so on and so on. So this is a quite a long uh, list of data sets that all um, have the word vacatures in them, so 10 in total, uh, but we are only interested in the uh, second one. So if we know the identifier, we can either first have a quick glimpse on the internet or we know the identifier um, once um, already and this will usually not change. So we can go with this identifier for all the other analyses as well. Then we um, use the CBS get data uh, function from the CBS or data R package to download exactly this data frame into our R session. The downside of, um, of using this is of course also that it will download every time the code runs. This is time and energy consuming and probably not always needed because the updates of these tables are maybe done once a year and not that frequent and we can um, really avoid this. So there are different approaches of course here to do a hashtag before that, only download it once and to save it. But um, I will later show you in a, a function that I wrote how you can automate it, this process a little bit more. So if you download, store, and update um, this uh, data set, um, I recommend to store it also and not download it all the time. And um, I have a proposed folder structure that will, uh, I will show later in this project also. Uh, one of this is a folder called raw, where I download all the raw data that's not cleaned and not tidy. And um, in this folder, I have another folder called CBS. So this is where I would like to download my, um, my um, 
table of interest and to store it also for further use. What I also want to do is integrate a year in the file name because then I know uh, at what year I retrieve this data set and maybe later with an if statement I can also check if there's an update so if the year is still the same year as my system year or the, um, the year that I do the analysis then I might probably not need an update otherwise I will do an update. So here I've defined two different paths, one for the di directory, which is raw and then CBS, and then also one uh, for the file name, which takes automatically the system date. This is the year of the system date. So this would be now the 2022 and paste this um, with, a, um, with the name of the file that I want to store. So this would be 2022 raw friction period. And I want to later save this as an RDS file because this is, um, at least from what I uh, usually read, uh, one of the quickest to use. But um, what to do if the directory, if we start with a new directory and we don't want or like a new uh, project, so to say, and we don't have all these folders uh, available already, then we can also integrate an if statement and we uh, ask if the directory does not exist. So this is the exclamation mark before the directory exists. This negates the directory uh, exists uh, question, so to say the logical operation here. Then we create exactly the directory that we uh, want and that we don't have at the moment. In the second step, we save the downloaded data exactly where we want it in the directory um, uh, path and the file name path. And um, this is basically the first um, elements that we would need for a function that we can use and reuse all the time. So I will walk you quickly through this uh, function that I wrote, and, and this is only the first part. Later, I will show also the second part um, of the function, and um, this is something that you that you can maybe use if you if you would like to retrieve the same data as well. So we um, are. I create a function called fr uh, function CBS friction period. It's a function with uh, different arguments. At the moment, there are only three arguments. One is the folder name, uh, which I set to a standard is raw and CBS. Feel free to adapt this if you want to use a different folder structure, of course. And then also a file name, which I always also keep the same. It's the raw friction period. And as I said before, the, the year will automatically be added to that. Force download is um, a um, another argument that I keep in there just to, if I want a, um, a download again, although I already have the file because I think maybe it's corrupt or maybe I, I opened it and changed something or I think there's an update, then I can also set this to true and then I will force a new update, although it's actually not needed. There are some um, required libraries here that I use. I usually use here because then you have um, uh, more flexibility about the path and the relative paths. This is uh, very handy if you do presentations, for example, and you want to put the presentations in subfolders, as I can show you later where my presentation, the one that I'm showing here is now. Um, but also if you use Bookdown, because our markdowns, maybe you know that already, but they will always render in their own environment. And then if you use absolute paths, you will have problems with, um, yeah, with finding the, the uh, relevant um, uh, folder. And so uh, using here um, is a very good way of uh, avoiding this and always being flexible. We of course need CBS or data R. This is the one um, that we are uh, using for downloading the data. And I also use Lubridate. This is a nice package to, um, to transform date and time variables. This uh, snippet of code you already know. This is the one where we uh, create our directory path and our file path where we add the system date before the file name and the arguments of the file name and the folder name. They are um, taken from the standard sets of the function. Then we create a full path where we smash those two together, the directory path and the file path. And then we also have our, um, uh, our if statement. If the directory does not exist already, then we will create it on the fly. And then we download the data. This is basically where the magic happens, so to say. Uh, so if we have a false download, if this is set to true or the um, file does not yet exist, and this is now handy because we, we set the file to the, uh, the file name is the year where we downloaded the first time. So next year in 2023, the file name would not exist anymore because the um, 2022 changed to 2023. And in either of these cases, we will use the CBS get data um, command and download the respective data set into our um, environment. 
in a functional environment and then save it as an RDS in this, um, uh, in this full path. If we already have this, so if this um, if statement is not true, then that means that we have already an updated and um, uh, a useful uh, data frame. So we just load it into our environment. I do here a super assign. Um, this is only needed now because I also structurally go through uh, these different uh, steps while creating this presentation. So that means I cannot yet use uh, the DF vacancy if I if I do not super assign it with, with this one, but this will be gone um, in the actual data. So you don't need that. And uh, I will show this later. Now let's take, uh, have a look. This is step three. Um, and make our uh, calculations. First of all is, of course, inspecting the data that we downloaded. And what we see here already is that um, some of these variables are quite cryptic. So Bedrijfskenmerke, apart from being in Dutch, but T001081, nobody knows what this means. And some of these others, the periods, for example, they are only um, stored as character variables and we cannot use them as date and time variables. There is where two uh, more functions from the package come in very handy, and one is CBS at label columns and at date columns. So if you use the downloaded data set, this the data frame vacancies, and um, we uh, add those two uh, functions as well, and we will see that we get new columns. And the Bedrijfskern Merken also now have a label that is a bit more readable, and the periods become a date variable, which can be seen here from the table. And um, the um, in the uh, the table always gives also um, returns the um, the data class. So here this is a date, and now we can use the date and and use um, Lubri date for example to extract the years. But what data is relevant for our analysis? We are uh, only interested in the yearly average, uh, which is in the period uh, frequency. We have quarter and years, so we filter out all the years. And uh, we also have several industry sectors which are available, uh, which is all economy uh, activities, but then also um, some, some other more specialized um, uh, industries, for example, um, uh, water um, industries or energy and, and all these um, different uh, types that exist. I will now focus on all economic activi activities. So we'll filter out the T001081 uh, from the data set. And uh, this is um, the entire code that we use to um, calculate the friction period in short. So we start off with the data that we downloaded from the internet. We add the label columns and we add the date columns. In the second step, we filter out only the years and not the quarters because we're not interested in those. And then we also filter out all um, industries. So we are um, in interested in the global average, so to say. Then we do a mutate, and I hope that you um, know a little bit about um, uh, dplyr and uh, tidyverse um, to understand uh, why I use the pipe operator and also to understand the different uh, functions that I use, like filter and mutate. These are from dplyr, and um, yeah, they are they are very useful uh, to make this code a little bit more readable. So we mutate, and that means we create a new column. We take out the year of uh, the period date. So um, this was um, a bit more information than we needed. So we only need the year. And here is our function to calculate the friction period. So the friction period is uh, 365 days. So this is a typo. I just spot, so this should be 365, but will um, be um, uh, not a problem in the function later uh, because I make this dynamic. Then we take um, the vacancies divided by the open vacancies plus 28 days. And um, then we also use a friction or we um, have a new column friction period in weeks where we just divide the days by seven and we have the, uh, the weeks. At the end, I'm only interested in keeping the years and um, some, some more variables. And then also for my own uh, sake, I um, rename those into English names because then I find it um, easier to work with later. This is basically the output that we get. We have from the year 1997 all the way up to 2021, we have um, open vacancies, filled vacancies, the friction period in days and the friction period in weeks. And um, now it's time to uh, define our function and also to extend the function that we already have. And I have some of, um, of these um, elements that I will walk you through in the, uh, in the um, R code. So um, some of them 
already known industry no uh, folder name file name and force download these we already had but i also want uh, years because i'm not interested in all the years all the time so 1997 1998 is maybe not of interest i only want 2021 for example so i can uh, use this here and make this dynamic the industry i can also change this is the standard industry so across all industries so i'll keep here um, a standard um, in there and the year days, this is where the typo does not matter anymore because I set it now to 365, but very often in economic evaluations, we would use 365.25, uh, which gives you a little bit more flexibility, but the guideline specifically mentions 365. Now, this part is already known. We already downloaded the data, and this is basically what we did above the calculation um, that are needed. We add the label columns, we add the date columns, we filter for the year, we filter for the industry, which is now the argument from the function, and also the year days, which was the argument from the function 365 instead of the type of 362. And um, we rename um, our, uh, our data frame and we keep only the years that we are interested in. So if we do this now, if we test the function, uh, you can use this, of course, from the R code. Um, then the only thing that we really have to define is the years. For the rest, we have standard values. So from 2011 to 2021, and now the DTP is um, the function that I uh, told you to render this table a little bit more nicely. And then what we see is we have the friction days and the friction period um, for all the different years that we wanted them for 2011 up to 2021. Uh, this is just an, um, something that I added because I wanted to see how this developed over time. This is a nice plot maybe from, uh, from um, 2011 to 2021. So we see that gradually uh, the friction period, so the time that it needs to fulfill a vacancy went up. Then we had our corona year and now it's um, up again. So that's nice to, uh, to eyeball the data and just to see what happens. But this is not of no further use for this presentation and analysis. But what now? Now we need um, to uh, calculate further. We know that the friction period is now the maximum days to account for productivity losses. In 2021, these were now 120 days. We just calculated them. Um, and productivity costs per hour um, are 34.75 years. This is 2014 data, and it's an average for male and female. Depending on the disease that you're studying, you might have a different uh, proportion, maybe more male, more female. Um, and um, uh, these are taken from the Dutch um, Economic Evaluation Guidelines, Table 6.2. What I see in many publications is still that the same price is used, so 34.75. I just checked some yesterday, and uh, up until last year, this were also not indexed. Now, this should be indexed with either the Consumer Price Index. I put also here the table ID from, uh, from CBS. This is what you now can hopefully use for your own advantage. You know the table identifier, you know the code to download this from CBS. So you could, in theory, uh, calculate your own consumer price index numbers that are used uh, to index this from 2014 to 2021. But also there is a, a price index for work and this is another table identifier. So maybe this might be even more appropriate, but this is a methodological question um, and uh, beyond the scope of this presentation. If we keep all variables, um, as in the Dutch EE guideline in the example number nine that is already shown for 2014, then we can assume a person with three days of work, eight hours uh, per day and 34.7 hours um, uh, euro per hour. Um, in 2014, the product, uh, productivity losses for this person were 10,091 in some sense. And in 2021, with the downloaded data that we just had is uh, uh, 1,291 in some sense. So we see that there's really a difference between those um, numbers. And this also means that we really have to um, recalculate at least the friction period uh, for the um, respective year of analysis, but also keep in mind that these are still the old values for the price and these might not be appropriate anymore. So the difference in cost might be even, even higher. Take home messages from this first part of the presentation is that CBS or data is a really powerful package to download data from CBS and really any data that's provided by CBS. Um, and um, if you do this um, in an iterative process, so if you do not take care that uh, maybe the data is already stored somewhere in your system, then you would have to run the code every time again and again. This will be type consuming. So better write your own function and um, uh, make use and reuse this uh, for other uh, purposes. And um, you could, uh, for example, also put those into your own package that you use 
and reuse and share with your colleagues if you like. Um, estimating cost of productivity losses uh, can be fun if you do it with R and especially with this package that I just talked about. Uh, but we need to consider more than just uh, resource use, the proportion male female, also something that we could get from CBS, unpaid work um, and the average number of um, hours per day of work. This could also be part of that. Thank you. Just a quick warning, Frederick. You're done. So 15 minutes remaining. <laughs> All right, so 15 minutes remaining. This is time to talk about writing technical reports in R with Bookdown. Um, so the aim here really is to get you started with Bookdown without knowing much about the technicalities because I usually uh, like to just start off and, and do uh, stuff and uh, do a lot of trial and error. So um, everything that I show here is really a personal view and the downside is that you can have a high level of frustration and things can take a while until you figure out how they're really uh, need to uh, be going. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I have a couple of slides with um, presentations from people uh, that um, actually wrote the package book down, which is much more uh, into detail. But uh, here I really want to get you started um, with your own analysis, maybe directly after this workshop um, at the end of the day, of course. So what you need is R, our studio. You need some knowledge of R Markdown. So it is uh, good if you already used R Markdown before. And you also need uh, Zotero if you want to add references. There is also a possibility to add references with other pro uh, programs, but Zotero really works best in my opinion. So why do we use um, uh, Bookdown and not uh, Markdown? Uh, there are a couple of advantages, at least to me. And um, first, it demands a little bit more structure because you have to have chapters in sequences and you really have to think about your project in a um, sequential um, order. Then also a big pro is that you can automatic, um, automatically have cross-referencing of figures and tables. So you don't need to have uh, to take care about the numbering of those. You can always link to those, cite them in text. And if you click on this, you will jump back or forth to the table or the figure. You can render those in HTML to share and uh, include PDF files for download. And also there are many different uh, styles available um, to, uh, to render this. The most comprehensive guide is, of course, the, the package guide book down. I link this here. And you can start um, by um, first installing book down. And then you will have a possibility in your R Studio with file, new project, new directory, and then a book project using book down. This is great for the first step. And maybe you've done this already, but then you will get a lot of different files of um, uh, which you don't use. So um, the package structure that you can find on GitHub for this presentation is something uh, that you could use and just you know change uh, some things here and there um, and, um, and, and have this um, as, a, as a way to start. I want to show the book down that I wrote for this, um, uh, this session. Um, so you can also find this on GitHub. This would be the HTML version of it. So you have a, a preface, you have um, um, my name, for example, also a title and a subtitle. You can scroll through all of those. You have references, either scientific references or from the packages. And then if we uh, scroll through these different chapters, you will see that there's a lot of tables also here. Some tables don't render that nicely. Some do a little bit nicer because I have also the code for this um, uh, yeah, for your use later. And um, so you can click uh, through this in the HTML format. If you click on this one, you will automatically download the PDF version of it. You can also search in here. You can change um, uh, the font, have a night view and uh, whatsoever. So there's a lot of possibilities to, do, um, to, to work around with your um, book. And this is, I think, the nicest part. This is exactly the same thing, but then rendered in a nice PDF document with including our code or not including, it's really up to you. So this is not the ni so nice table. And this is the somewhat nicer table and um, that I will show you in this presentation or at least the code that you can use for it. So in this presentation, I will uh, give you a very brief overview of the most important files that you need in Bookdown and also a proposal for a structure and how to structure your um, um, project for that. Some very basics about the YAML header um, or the Bookdown JML and some um, tweaks from your preamble.txt. Um, I will also show you how to print nice tables or at least give you the code for it so you can start directly and also show you how to add citations in Zotero. So first, creating your project with Bookdown. Um, there you need a folder structure to keep um, overview 
and then also set up your citations. So it's a bit of reverse order. We will first talk about citations. Then we will tweak your book down dot jml and the preamble dot text. Then you can write code and text and your analysis in a sequential order. You render and then you are done. So step number one, folder structure. This is uh, something that I like to work with. Give me a little bit more structures inspired from the internet, but feel free to use another one, of course. So you have your project um, home level um, and um, the underscore book folder is something you do not need to create. It will be created for you if you use Bookdown. I have a, a raw, raw and a data um, a file a folder for uh, raw data or those that's already cleaned and uh, tidy. Some images that I would like to export and then my scripts uh, are and are markdown and then different references. And this is something that you should already um, uh, uh, create a references folder, and then you will have Sotero packages and a CSL file in there. So more specifically about the references, um, you need to um, get uh, preferably Zotero. You can download it through this link, but then you also need an extension, and this is Better Bit Text. And Better Bit Text you can download um, as an extension for Zotero. And this one will create citations, citation keys that you need um, in your R markdown. Citation keys can also be customized in Zotero preferences and better bib text. I will show you this also, um, how this looks like. And this is something that you have to refer to in your um, document um, uh, if you want to cite something. So if I open my Zotero and I um, put it in here, there. This is one of those, and here you have a citation key. It's uh, called crawl2014, and you can also have this um, with underscores or um, the yeah how you like it, and you can uh, change this so you can reference this in your R markdown later. This is something that you need, and also you can export or you should export um, this library and to make it also. Um, a live library by selecting keep updated. That means that this file will always be updated once you add a new uh, file into your Zotero library, and then you can directly reference this. Um, so after loading your packages um, in the um, in your uh, in your R Studio, then you can run this command: nitter write bib. And they, um, this one will, in the uh, folder references, make a new .bib file for you with all the references from the, um, from the different packages that you use. So this is very handy. You don't have to keep an overview about the, uh, over these different packages. This will be created for you on the fly. Now we also need a citation style language. And um, for example, you would like to use Nature uh, or uh, APA. Um, and this you can download on the Zotero style repository, choose which, whichever you like, but put this also in the references folder uh, in your R project so that um, R Markdown knows directly which of these uh, or how it should format the citations for you. So this is nothing that you have to put in uh, or to, to do in Zotero, but you have to um, download this separately and put this in your uh, um, R project. So put this in your references. And um, if you want more information about uh, the um, citation style language, you can also refer to the R Markdown cookbook. Step number three is tweak your YAML header. So this is the YAML header is basically the metadata of your book. And this contains some generic information about the author, the date, but also how your uh, table of contents looks like. So how many levels should be shown uh, in the table of contents on the first page. Also here, you can set the font size, the geometry of the document. And also here you specify which citations and which citation style you need. This can be very extensive. So depending on how many variables you want to control, this can be quite long. And um, therefore you can also create a separate file. This is the underscore bookdown dot JML. And in this one, you can put all the different extra information that you do not want in the YAML header to make it a little bit nicer and a better overview of that. The YAML header understands R, but this does not always work for me, especially not for packages such as, uh, such as here. Um, so you have to really have a, a relative or an absolute relative path in the YAML header. Um, so the YAML header could uh, look uh, like this. 
um, and um, you also need to include a preml.txt. And this is a, another um, file that I will show you later uh, what this should at least entail. So in the book term YAML, I specify usually the document name and also the different R markdowns that should be rendered in sequence. And I will show you this in the last minutes uh, that I um, have in this presentation in uh, our studio. Second, uh, third step is also to uh, tweak your preamble text. So more specific LaTeX code lives in this one. Um, also LaTeX, if you don't know about this, um, has different packages just like R and some of them um, uh, I use uh, to uh, render these nice uh, PDF documents, uh, which you should also then um, install, but this can also be done on the fly if you uh, specify those in the uh, preamble.txt. For example, long tables, if you have very long tables that go well over th several pages, then you should use uh, this one. The last page is for having um, something like uh, 49 pages out of 52, like in this presentation landscape float to keep the figures in place, something that I found really annoying and took me a lot of time to, to get through this and fancy header to have some more dynamics in the header that you want. And um, you activate those packages and install them by um, this code. And this is um, in the preamble text. So if you study this, you will find out more about that. And then if you're done, you can start with um, writing your analysis. You uh, would use one chapter per RMD. You finish uh, with one chapter for references because this will always be put at the end. And um, my recommendation is to start with something, something like that. Preface, introduction, chapter one to chapter N and then references very briefly and very shortly. Um, but you can of course have any other um, way of writing this if you like. In the uh, chunks, do not use underscores because this will somehow mess up the entire document. So always use um, 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 this, this sign and always do restart your R session before you compile or render because otherwise you will get an error. At least I get a lot of errors um, in um, not doing so. Now I would uh, like to know um, how much time I have left to go through the R studio. Or am I already above time? Um, you're down to the last five minutes. I have five minutes. And that includes questions. Everybody start thinking big questions. Right, good. Took me longer than expected. Um, so uh, yeah, if you have questions, uh, please just interrupt. Otherwise I will show you um, how this uh, book down works live um, in the R Studio. So this is my R Studio project for, um, uh, for this workshop. You can download this on GitHub, as I said. Um, this is my uh, folder structure. Some of those uh, um, uh, are, of course, um, added um, by using uh, GitHub, but also uh, by running uh, Bookdown. Here in Book, this is a folder that's automatically created. Here, are all, here do live all the PDF files and the ones that are needed for the HTML book. And in Scripts, uh, in Markdown, here we can see um, the different markdowns uh, that are needed for rendering in the book. I always start with an index. And here at the beginning, you will see the YAML header, which is uh, which lives between these three stripes and the last three stri stripes. We can specify the title, the subtitle, the author. Here we also see that our code is understood because it will take the system time automatically uh, for, the, um, for rendering the document. We can set the font size and also the geometry in terms of centimeters from each side of the of a of a page so we have a lot of flexibilities here we also specify our um, references so the zotero library but also the packages that are um, created and we also define our uh, csl style and now we can start writing everything in curly brackets with a minus sign means that this will not be numbered so we do not want the preface to be numbered we also do not want the setup to be numbered and then we can um, start writing and also to do our analysis, so to say, on the fly. This is how I use it. I usually don't have um, analysis and then writing. For me, analysis and writing go together um, because it's uh, easier for me to just remember what I've done. Um, so in the introduction, and this is the uh, code tutorial that you can find on the r 4 hda uh, website for the, the discrete event simulation, I just copied this code. and. Um, uh, made a book out of this. And um, I think in number three events, this is um, where I also show some of these tables that you can use. So if you want to um, make a nice table, use Nitter and Cable um, or Cable Extra 
to make it even nicer. And um, these are some functions that I wrote that make it flexible for you to render this either in PDF or in HTML at the same time. So feel free to use these uh, functions, the FKBL, which is just a wrapper function for cable, um, but has a lot of flexibility and also uh, FKBL uh, KBL style, which is for the cable extra. It will add some scroll boxes. If you are in HTML, if you have big tables, you have scroll boxes to so scroll left and right, up and down. Um, and also the scale option to make huge tables in PDF uh, somewhat smaller to fit them um, on the uh, on the page. Um, yeah, so really um, this workshop um, provides you with all the necessary files to start right away. Use, uh, use this structure if you like, go into scripts and just change all the different markdowns. Keep the index file though, and then uh, be only inspired by uh, what I wrote here. You can also um, put the um, HTML, um, H, uh, the original R for HTA um, files next to it and see where the differences yeah. are. Yeah, thank you, uh, Frederick. I think uh, we're out of time now. We had uh, one interesting question from Rob in the chat, which I'll allow you to answer directly into the chat if that's okay.